Podcast. Our fourth speaker today, uh, George Zervos, also has a chapter in the uh, the book Jesus and Temple, but he'll go beyond the contents of that chapter and mm-hmm. talking about some of his current work to uh, to date on the infancy gospel of James. Uh, George was born and raised in North Carolina, but his family uh, comes from a little island near the uh, island of Rhodes. Uh, He's Greek, and uh, he is an associate professor of philosophy and religion at the University of North Carolina in Wilmington. A bachelor's degree from North Carolina Greensboro, and a master of theology from the University of Athens, and a PhD from Duke University. So that's where uh, uh, George became friends with uh, Jim Charlesworth. But unfortunately, you were there a little after he and I were there together with Steve Robinson. So, But we've all got Duke connections, so uh, we'll watch out what happens in the basketball game. Okay. Um, uh, George's areas of expertise include a lot of things dealing with early Christianity, the Apocrypha, New Testament studies, and so on. And uh, But most importantly, he's a wonderful person, and uh, really fun, and I, I bring as evidence the fact that he has played a consulting role in a locally filmed horror movie called <laughs> Conjuring. He also uses his expertise as a former Greek Orthodox priest in playing the role of a Catholic priest or exorcist in that movie. Oh, where did you get that information? <laughs> we do research. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, uh, The Conjuring. <laughs> I didn't think I would have to give an apology for that, but... <laughs> Uh, <clears throat> actually, The Conjuring ended up being, as of now, the third highest grossing uh, what they call supernatural film in history. It is uh, past The Exorcist and in only like three years, and it's up to like 400 million and counting. So I get for my tremendous leading role in it, I get a check for about 80 or $90 every six months or so. <laughs> Uh, Thanks for that tremendous uh, (laughs) success. Uh, First, I want to uh, echo what uh, Professor Charlesworth said earlier about you people and just how fabulous you are. Uh, I'm from the South, grew up in the South, born in the South, and we're supposed to be friendly and congenial people down there. But when I came here, (laughs) it's like, who are these people? Uh, the nicest, most polite, uh, clean environment, clean air. That's what we should be claiming for North Carolina. And after being here, I don't think I can say anything like that anymore. But uh, God bless you. Y'all are, y'all are fabulous and just keep being what you are. Um, uh, don't take this wrong, but uh, when I came here with the mountains and all that I, and meeting the people and the clean environment, uh, it's sort of like it brings uh, to mind those old movies on Shangri-La, where you just go through this mountain pass and you're, whoa, what is this? You know? But uh, you're very fortunate to have what you have. <clears throat> I'm the uh, odd man out today, basically. I'm here with these uh, world-renowned uh, archaeologists, uh, tremendous professors and I have never done archaeology, uh, not in the ground, getting my fingers dirty, but uh, let me just say that I think what I do is uh, a manner of philological archaeology, which is mining in texts. You have an ancient text, and it has gone through a whole process of centuries and centuries of people basically tampering with it and uh, changing it, inserting this, inserting that, changing words. And uh, the document that, uh, that I've been working on for 35 years, I haven't hit the 50 yet, uh, <clears throat> is something that I started in graduate school at Duke under uh, Dr. Charles Worth's uh, guidance, you might say. He was my dissertation advisor. 
And uh, I just got into this document because it was a very ancient uh, Christian apocryphon about Mary, Jesus's mother. And uh, I just kept digging and digging and I just kept finding stuff and I'm still digging and uh, new things are coming to light all the time. Uh, thanks to the uh, developments in technology, uh, I'm able to present just masses and masses of information. Uh, this document has been preserved in uh, maybe 130 or so Greek manuscripts dating from 200 AD to the 19th century. <clears throat> and uh, no two of them are alike. Some of them are radically different. And uh, I have been ex especially intent on working with the papyrus which is just a miraculous document to have survived uh, 1,800 years in almost perfect condition. Uh, it's extremely rare to find an ancient book that has been uh, preserved whole in a papyrus copy with all the pages intact, no holes in it, just almost perfectly preserved from, the, uh, from around 200 or so AD. And... Uh, Nobody has had a chance to look at it since it was discovered and hidden away in the Bodmer Library in Geneva. Uh, I tried all kinds of means to get access to photographs, uh, nothing. I worked on this thing until uh, probably the year 2005 before I realized that they had finally published photographs of it in 2000. And so since then I've been completely immersed in working on the papyrus, and that's where the really interesting uh, uh, information and details come out about the antiquity of this document. Uh, the title of the document on the papyrus is what you see, the Genesis of Mary. Um, and uh, that is not repeated in any of the other copies, the 130 odd copies, which mostly refer it to refer to it as the birth of Mary. Um, <clears throat> but the word Genesis and the word Genesis with two news, Genesis has one in, Genesis has two. Genesis means birth. Genesis means come into being, like the book of Genesis. It's not the birth of the world, it's how the world came to be, how it came into being. Uh, it, was being it was called into being by the logos, uh, the, you know, the word of God. Um, so I'm sure you're looking at that picture and it's screaming at you idolatry. Okay, I, ha I come from the Greek Orthodox tradition, which I always have to explain what that is because people aren't really familiar with what it is. Let's say it's the uh, other half, the second half, uh, the eastern half, I would say it's the first half, of what calls itself the one holy Catholic and apostolic church. In other words, the church that came into being and basically took over the, uh, the government of the world in the fourth century AD and uh, attempted to wipe out all other uh, uh, Christianities and paganisms, and uh, they were pretty hard on the Jews as well, uh, and survived to this very day. And it's, 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 just, it's a massive, massive organization in the West. So think of the One Holy Catholic and Apostolic Church as the uh, Western Roman Catholic Church, and I would say the Eastern Orthodox Catholic Church. So that's the one I come from, Orthodox Catholic, which is the original tradition that was eventually uh, modified in the West with the rise of the papacy and uh, some changes in the theology. But all, all things said, it's like 99% the same religious tradition. So we in the East do not have statues. That is a Western thing, and you will find that statue in the Vatican, actually, in St. Peter's uh, Basilica. Uh, so Mary, uh, definitely two different people we're talking about here, the Mary of faith 
and then the Mary of history, the reality of Mary. And uh, I got into this, uh, this study of this document uh, to find out more about Mary, and then I ended up finding uh, a lot about Jesus and a lot about possibly the earliest, earliest Christian tradition, which was a, a Jewish Christian tradition uh, dating back to the first century AD that has disappeared because it has been covered over by, just like an archeological site, the archeologists have to you know, uh, take away layers and layers of dirt and sand and all kinds of garbage and just crud in general. I know that's a good scholarly world, just crud, just clearing away crud. And that's what I had to do with this. If you have a manuscript or a, a book that has been uh, copied generation after generation for something like 1800 years and every copyist had to have his own go at it to change this or change that i didn't like this i need to you know this doesn't agree with my doctrine so i'm going to change the book uh i had to clear all that away and the worst of the crud believe it or not was from the 20th century when the modern scholars got a hold of it and uh, it was just such a mess trying to figure out what the original document looked like uh, until I was able to get photographs of the papyrus and just go into it myself. So be looking for this uh, volume that's going to come out uh, in the next uh, year or two. Uh, Dr. Charlesworth is uh, helping with that. So... Uh, I'm, I'm working on it, and uh, I think it's going to uh, basically raise some eyebrows in the, in the scholarly world, in the Christian world. Okay, the Mary of faith, we'll just go through this because you, most of you probably uh, know all about this. She is known <clears throat> in the, and I'm going to say Catholicizing circles, Catholicizing, meaning East and West, and other churches like high church Episcopalians who <clears throat> have sort of a Catholic bent to them. In the Catholicizing traditions, <clears throat> she is the ever virgin Theotokos, meaning mother of God, birth giver of God. And uh, the ever virgin part of it is, is what comes under the question, under question. Um, just looking at, okay, just looking at uh, just some of the feast days. We talk about uh, Jewish liturgy. Uh, Christianity or Catholic Christianity developed a very, very elaborate and sophisticated liturgical uh, cycle. And even to this very day, there are a number of holidays in the church calendar that... Uh, uh, you know, or more about Mary than they are about Jesus. In fact, the church calendar starts with the, uh, the birthday of Mary, the nativity of Mary. <clears throat> and here's one of the hymns uh, talking about uh, the tree of David, branch of the tree of David, most admirable Mary. Birth was a consolation to her parents, St. Joachim and St. Anne, where did that come from? Here the churches, Catholic churches all over the world are singing these hymns and they don't know that this information came from an apocryphal document that they did not include in the New Testament canon. Uh, any information on the nativity of Mary came from this document, the Genesis of Mary, the Gospel of James, the Protoevangelium of James. Um, <clears throat> it goes on and on. November 21st, uh, the entrance into the temple. That's not Jesus's entrance into the temple. That's Mary's entrance into the temple. And here's a hymn. This is a hymn. I'm, I'm giving you translations of the hymnology directly out of the church services. Uh, you virgin had not known wedlock. Yourself, a most pure temple, have gone within the temple of God. The Protoevangelium or the Genesis of Mary talks about Mary being dedicated to the temple as a three-year-old child, and she remained in the temple, lived in the temple for nine years. 
And uh, we'll look a little farther down at the amazing things that happened in the temple. And that's another reason that these great archaeologists have uh, brought me tagging along, because uh, here you have an extremely early Christian document lauding the temple, the Jewish temple. And for that to happen in Christianity, that's a real oddity, uh, you know, for for uh, Christians to be so in favor of uh, the Jewish temple and the Jewish priesthood, uh, which this document is. And the more I looked into it, the more I realized this is just not like anything else that's out there, you know, in early Christianity. Uh, Mary eventually goes through the whole liturgical cycle, comes to the last uh, liturgical observation of the, of the Christian year, which is August 15th, and it's the falling asleep or the dormition of the Virgin Mary. And uh, here again is the theology involved in the nativity. You preserved your virginity. In falling asleep, you did not forsake the world, Theotokos, and by your prayers, you deliver our souls from death. Mary is taking on a distinct character of being a savior. And in the, uh, I guess, Catholicizing tradition again, Mary is uh, referred to as God after God. God after God. If you go to the Catholicizing old countries like Italy, Greece, Mediterranean areas, and you count up how many churches are dedicated to Mary as opposed to dedicated to Jesus or any of the other saints or holy people, it's just overwhelming. It has to be like 90%. No question about it. Virgin Mary Church is all over the place. Anybody who's been to, uh, to Italy or Greece, just walk around and you can verify that. Uh, <clears throat> Mary, the mother of God. This is St. Gregory, the theologian, uh, a fourth century father, one of the three great fathers of the Eastern Church. St. Basil, St. John Chrysostom, and St. Gregory, the theologian. And you can see where this thing is going by the fourth century. If anyone doesn't believe that, the Ho that Holy Mary is the mother of God, he is severed from the Godhead. Uh, this became, in other words, Christian doctrine developed along these lines so that belief in Mary is, you know, right belief, orthodox belief. And if you don't believe that, then you don't belong in the church or you have nothing to do with God. Uh, St. Basil, another one of the great fathers, uh, Mary is a perpetual virgin. It's just not not accepting that she's the mother of God. She is the ever virgin, perpetually virgin mother of God. Now, where this comes from, obviously uh, you know your New Testament and you probably are blinking your eyes and wondering where all this comes from. Well, it doesn't come from the New Testament. It comes from the Genesis of Mary. This document has become the source of major, major doctrines in, in Catholic Christianity, uh, which was the only Christianity for an awful long time. <laughs> you know, we take that for granted. Um, and the source is a non-canonical document. In other words, it's not in the Bible. In Greece, there are just multiple copies, hundreds of copies. I'm sure there are hundreds more that have been destroyed down through the centuries. Uh, I'm just working with the ones that survived. So the paradox, you see the mystery, just mystery after mystery. Why is all this happening? Um, Mary the Redeemer. And this is a, a part of the chant in uh, what they call the supplication service to the Virgin Mary. It's, what, it's the most popular, popular service uh, among the people. Uh, and that's... Uh, Basically, most holy Theotokos, mother of God, save us. You're the savior, save us. There's a tremendous, tremendous uh, association, relationship, back and forth uh, in the minds of the people. You know, the people who represent the ancient, or not the ancient, let's say the medieval church, the Catholicizing traditions. Um, 
and see here, uh, you know my offense, absolve it as you will. Mary forgives sins. So uh, this thing is mushrooming, as you can see. <laughs> and it just gets, uh, some people would say, out of hand. Here you have a, a Byzantine coin. It's a later coin, but it gives you an idea of what um, Eastern Christianity, let's say the Eastern Roman Empire, uh, you know, this is one of their coins. This is, uh, this is a representation of the faith. Now, what is the Byzantine Empire? Well, it's the Roman Empire. Most people think the Roman Empire fell in the fourth century. Well, only the uh, Western half fell in the fourth century. The Eastern half continued on for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years, actually another thousand years. Um, and here you have a regular coin of the realm. Uh, on the left side there, you see Jesus seated on his throne uh, with his hand up in blessing. And on the right side, you have the Virgin Mary crowning the emperor, crowning the emperor. And this is just a common co uh, coin of the, uh, of the realm. And uh, this is referring uh, the invincible general. Mary was considered to be the commander in chief of the Byzantine armed forces. Uh, there were 20 times in Byzantine history, long Byzantine history, a thousand years of history where Mary uh, is, was considered to have saved the city of Constantinople and Eastern Christianity, the Eastern Roman Empire from invasions from different people. So uh, it goes on and on. It gets better and better and bigger and bigger. Here is something that... Uh, uh, happened some 30 years ago in Egypt, <clears throat> right at the time that <clears throat> I was on an expedition down there with Professor Charlesworth. He probably doesn't remember it, but uh, we actually went to this church. There was a church in the Sahara uh, that it was uh, claimed to, it's on television, it was claimed to have apparitions of the Virgin Mary like that. Somebody took a picture of it or whatever, you know. Uh, so we went and stood with Dr. Charlesworth and Joe Dickerson. <coughs> we stood out in, uh, in the area in front of his church, <coughs> looking up, waiting to see the apparition ourselves. And I guess we weren't fortunate for that to have happened. Uh, well, anyway, that's the Mary of faith. And that takes a lot of faith. And uh, there are hundreds of millions of people, Christians all over the world, who believe this with every fiber of their heart and soul. Um, so now the Mary of history. If you ask most scholars or Protestants uh, what Mary was like, what Mary was really like, just you know, uh, put aside all of everything that you've just seen, uh, that's probably a suitable uh, photograph. Uh, of course, this is in an Arabic country, but uh, it's close enough. That's probably how Mary would have been dressed. I don't know if that was Jesus she was carrying and the little kid whose head is at the bottom may have been James, his brother, but you know, dirty, you see dirt everywhere. Uh, weird language that goes from right to left. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, dirty everything, you know, down in the dirt with the people. She was a woman of the people. Uh, she was a single mom with six or seven children at least. She had four sons, uh, a couple or three daughters, uh, and uh, none of this glory of the ever virgin, perpetual virgin Mary and all that. Uh, what do we know about Mary from the, uh, from the scriptures? Paul is the first one who really references her historically. And uh, this should mean a lot because Paul knew James, Peter, and John at least. He knew them personally. And uh, James was Jesus' brother and Mary's son. And he was the head of the first Christian community in Jerusalem after Jesus departed. Let's put it that way. 
Uh, James was extremely important. The uh, Jewish Christian church uh, of James. James uh, has gotten a, I won't say a bad press, but he's gotten no press compared to like Peter, for example, and Paul, you know, in the Western world. But uh, back in the first century, first century anyway, he was pretty much the man. <clears throat> and all the reports we have about him was that he was in the temple. He and the earliest Christians, the community, the Jewish Christian community, were in and out of the temple. He was known as James the Just. He uh, had camel's knees. He's described as having camel's knees because he was on his knees praying so much. And he had these big calluses on his knees. Uh, and this is where you had a, a controversy between James and Paul, which Paul wanted to you know, go out into the world, the Greco-Roman world. And James, Peter, and John wanted to stick with the Jews and uh, perpetuate uh, the Messiahship, let's say, of Jesus among the Jewish people. Uh, so this is what Paul says about Mary. Now, if he knew Mary, this is what he says. When the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his... Uh, oops. Okay. Gary, you have some uh, updates to uh, <laughs> install, but anyway. Uh, God sent forth his son made of, and you don't know whether there's an indefinite article there. Just say it could be made of a woman or made of woman, made under the law. So that's open to interpretation. A woman, what does that mean? Where did the ever virgin perpetual queen of heaven, you know, commander in chief of the armed forces? This is almost an insult, but this is the first reference we have to Jesus's mother. Uh, the next one is Mark. <clears throat> and it just seems by looking at Mark without looking at the later gospels that Jesus and his family didn't get along very well. That's what we, uh, we get out of Mark. A uh, negative relationship. Uh, uh, here's Mark 3.21. When, when his family heard what Jesus was doing, they went out to restrain him because people were saying he's gone out of his mind. Again, that's not what we generally see, you know, or think as far as uh, what's called the holy family. You know, Mary, Jesus, the brothers, James, and all that. But this is what Mark says. <clears throat> <coughs> Excuse me, you can look at that yourselves. Then his mother and brothers came, stood outside. They sent to him, called him. A crowd was sitting around and they said, your mother and your brothers and sisters are outside asking for you. And what's Jesus' answer? Who are my mother and my brothers? Then he looked around and said, here are my mother and brothers. You know, Whoever does the will of God is my brother and sister and mother. Well, that can be taken two ways. It can be taken positively uh, that, yeah, everybody, I love everybody. We're all one big happy family, you know, and that's how most people take it. But, you know, given that very, very early, Mary did not have that good a re uh, reputation, you might say, among, especially in the Gospel of Mark, it's almost like Jesus is blowing off his, his family. You know, and that kind of fits with some of the other things you see in Mark. Um, Mark 6, 4. The prophet is not without honor except in his own country and among his own relatives and in his own house. Now that's a very convoluted way of saying that prophets don't have honor among their relatives and in their own house. If you... If you uh, pull all the thoughts, you know, apart out of this thing. Uh, that's what, that's what basically is said. Uh, you look at Matthew uh, and Luke, and here we're going to uh, move into what I call the uh, first phase of the amplification of Mary from her early I don't want to say negative, but less than, you know, spectacular references in Paul and Mark. Matthew and Luke, 
revise Mark 6, 4 and eliminate the words of Jesus in Mark that include his relatives because it was unseemly, you know, as Christianity developed, as the church developed, it was unseemly for, you know, Mark to be saying these things, whatever his intention was. And uh, here we have, let's go ahead and look at it right quick. Uh, you can see how Matthew and Luke treat that same passage out of Mark. They take the thing about his relatives, you know, not giving Jesus honor. Um, so this is where we start talking about the, the, uh, the sand and the dirt and the crud being, you know, piled onto the historical and philological tradition. So this is phase one. Phase one continues. Uh, this is again around 85 or so. Uh, Matthew and Luke, as we all know, both begin their gospels with independent infancy narratives, including uh, uh, genealogies, whatever. Both of them include the virginal conception and birth of Jesus. This comes from Matthew and Luke. It does not come from Mark. Mark does not start until Jesus is 30 years old and uh, comes to be baptized. So there's no information whatsoever in Mark about uh, you know, nativity stories or virgin birth. Um, the significant thing here, and that's why it's, it's basically phase one of the amplification of Mary, is that they portray Mary's virginal status only up to the point that she, she gave birth to Jesus. And in fact, they have implications in their text that Mary was only a virgin during the time leading up to the birth of Jesus. Uh, so this is something when you, when you again, try to, uh, okay, here's Matthew uh, uh, 118 to 25, which is the key passage of the, uh, the nativity of Jesus. And of course, he validates Mary's virginity at the time of her conception with, with citing Isaiah, virgin will conceive and bear a son. Um, but before and after this particular uh, passage, this citation of the prophet, uh, Matthew, well, let's go ahead and look at the, uh, okay. Here it is within its larger context. And I've underlined the important passages there. Uh, Mary had been engaged to Joseph, but before they came together, okay, not really clear, but before they came together implies that they, they eventually came together as man and wife. And then you come down a little more, 123, look, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, call his name Emmanuel. Joseph wakes up, 125, and Joseph had no marital relations with her until she had born a son and she named him Jesus. Well, what's the, implica what's the implication there? You know, it's obvious. Matthew is not all about the, the uh, what they call the postpartum virginity of Mary. In fact, if he were, this would be a lot clearer, you know, along those lines, but he's just not concerned with it. Uh, Luke does pretty much the same thing. Uh, two, uh, four through seven, it went from Nazareth uh, to Judea. And in 2.7, she bore her firstborn son, and wrapped him in the you know, bands of cloth and all that. Okay, firstborn son. That leaves a little <laughs> vagueness, ambiguity there. If he's the firstborn son, you can take that to imply that there were other sons that followed. And in fact, that's what, uh, that's what Mark uh, tells us back in 6.3, uh, where Jesus' neighbors were not all that happy with him. He was going around preaching and uh, they knew him as, you know, little Jesus, the kid that was playing out in the street, you know, with the other kids and all that. 
And now he's trying to come off like a prophet. Uh, so he's teaching in the synagogue and his, his neighbors, you know, kind of, a, you know, they're taken aback with this and say, isn't this the carpenter, the son of Mary, which son of Mary is in itself, you know, a slight in that culture. Uh, I mean, my Israeli friends here <laughs> can correct me if they want, but, you know, uh, in, in those kind of cultures to refer to a man by his mother, uh, mother's name, that immediately brings up questions about uh, legitimacy or whatever. And then he says, the brother of James and Joses and Judas and Simon and are not his sisters with us. Okay, four brothers, at least a couple of sisters. I think Matthew, uh, Matthew makes that a little more clear that there may have been more than two. Uh, so that's phase one. Phase one, uh, virginity of Mary, virginal conception of Jesus um, is only up to that point where Jesus was born. And then what happened after that, there's, there's just no information whatsoever. Uh, until you get to Christian apocryphal writings, and this is around 150 A.D., uh, and with, with roots that go even earlier. And uh, Mary's virginity is extended beyond Jesus's conception to include the birth process. You really have to install these updates, Gary. I keep postponing it, so. Oh, okay, good, 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 all right, all right. Uh, okay, I'm sorry for it. <laughs> um, so uh, it's extended beyond just the conception, the virginal conception to the birth process, which is virginity in part two, in the process of giving birth and the aftermath, virginity after giving birth, which is now the doctrine, the dogma, the accepted doctrine of uh, the Catholicizing churches. And there are two apocryphal documents who first uh, make this uh, point historically, one is the Ascension of Isaiah, a very ancient, uh, very early Christian apocryphon, even though it's the Ascension of Isaiah, it's a, basically a Christian document, and the document known as the Protevangelium of James, which is nothing but the genesis of Mary uh, modified by a later editor in the second century uh, AD, mid-second century. Um, here's the ascension of Isaiah, touring heaven. He sees this woman of the family of David uh, named Mary and virgin, okay? Uh, Mary looked with her eyes there at the bottom. This is how Jesus is born. And this is a, not just, a, this is not a natural birth in, in either one of these documents. This is what you would call a docetic birth. Uh, and that was a, a very uh, widespread Christian uh, uh, belief in the late first, early second centuries that Jesus was not really a man with a, a human body. He was really not human. He only seemed to be human. Um, and of course, that was eventually wiped out with the, the, uh, the later Christian doctrine that uh, you know, Jesus is perfect God and perfect man. He definitely had a body. The Gospel of John really makes this point where Jesus shows his hands, you know, to Thomas, the doubting Thomas with the holes, you know, in his, well, his wrists, not his hands, and the spear wound in the side, meaning that that was his body and it was crucified. So uh, this docetic Christology uh, eventually went away. But that was the source of this perpetual virginity of Mary. So G Mary is somehow pregnant for a couple of months. I know uh, <laughs> many of the ladies here would say, that's nice, a two-month gestation period. And then uh, you just look up and there's the kid, you know. Uh, uh, Mary looked with her eyes and saw a small babe and was astonished. After she was astonished, her room was found as before she had conceived. Hey, that, that works. That's good. Huh? No labor. So here we have the Protovangelium of James, 
which uh, is, in fact, a pivotal document in the origin early development of Mariology uh, in the church. And as I've said, um, I have detected, or I think I've detected, nobody else yet uh, has even read my stuff, basically, uh, hoping that will change in another uh, couple of years, uh, that in fact we're dealing with a, an earlier document, a Jewish Christian document that is, is getting more and more prestige the more I work on it, uh, and legitimacy as being an early Jewish Christian document, and that this was later taken and purified, and, and basically what this editor in the second century did, he um, got passages from Luke and Matthew, nativity passages, and basically interlaced them into the document. He interpolated canonical material into the Genesis of Mary, and he threw some of his own stuff in there too, basically, and his own stuff is where the perpetual virginity comes in. Uh, so uh, what you have, you have two different documents. You have the Genesis of Mary, which is the early document, uh, and you have the Protovangelium of James, which is the modified version. <clears throat> okay. Um, basically, uh, this person, whoever this anonymous person was, was a super orthodox Catholic person. And think, this is the middle of the second century AD. This is astounding to find this kind of thing going on you know, in the, in the Christian world, the, the orthodox, the proto-orthodox, Bart Ehrman would call it proto-orthodox Christianity that eventually developed into Catholicism with the uh, priests and the sacraments and, and all of that. But the bottom line, if this editor, this redactor of the Genesis of Mary actually uh, created the doctrine of the perpetual virginity of Mary, then the Protovangelium of James is, it's a, a photograph, it's a literary photograph of the, the moment in time when Mary went from being just a, a virgin to being the perpetual virgin, which became the standard doctrine of, uh, of Catholicism. Um, <clears throat> Uh, okay, now here is the document. Yeah, isn't that beautiful? That's just amazing. Uh, I did, uh, I did uh, my minor in papyrology at Duke with these magnificent professors, Willis and Oates, and uh, I spent a lot of time just piecing together little pieces. You've seen the Dead Sea Scrolls, just little scraps here and there and things with holes in them. That's how Greek papyri are too. And they, they had me putting, you know, different uh, pieces together to make a larger document. And then you look at this. That is incredible. There's nothing else like this. Uh, dated to about the third century, around 200 or so, give or take, maybe 50 years. <coughs> this is uh, the first page. And you see, you can see at the top, Genesis, Genesis, Marias. And then Apocalypsis, Yaakov, who was James. Uh, there was no James in early Christianity. Sorry, Jim Charlesworth, but there was no James. Uh, wherever you see James in the Bible anywhere, the word is Yaakov, Jacob. Okay, just a little side thing there. Uh, the epistle of James is the epistle of Yaakov. Jacob, Jesus' older brother. And this is supposed to be a revelation of James. Um, it could be that this is one reason this document was set aside because uh, it was associated with James. Uh, none of the other titles, uh, you know, refer this as an apocalypse of James. None of the other manuscripts uh, beautifully written. The entire text is available. And I struggled for a couple of decades to try to reconstitute the text that was in this because that's the only page that was published back in the 50s out of 49 pages. 
And then uh, I struggled tremendously, I can tell you, uh, to try to do that because the later editors had just made a complete mess of publishing this thing. And uh, to try to, uh, I felt like a, an archaeologist trying to, you know, dig down into the sand and piece together, you know, what, what comes out of the sand and, and wipe away all of the mess that's on top of it. Well, finally, in the year 2000, the Bodmer Library uh, published an $800 volume, okay, with uh, all the photographs of this thing. And uh, I've been working on it ever since, and very intensely over the last, you know, five years or so, and hope to uh, present something nice uh, to the scholarly world and to the, uh, the believers today. Now, getting to our topic, the Jerusalem temple in the Protovangelium of James. Um, <clears throat> Mary's elderly parents, Joachim and Anna, very wealthy, very wealthy. He's one of the richest people. He gives more money to the temple than anybody else. And one time he goes to uh, give, give a large donation to the temple and he's insulted by somebody because he is childless. Uh, so the two parents are very upset about this and they vow to God that if they have a child, they'll dedicate it to the temple, whether it's a boy or a girl. So uh, here's where it gets kind of interesting. We have the roots of the Catholic doctrine of the Immaculate Conception here. The Immaculate Conception, not of Jesus, but of Mary. And it's like Joachim goes off on a business trip, and then he comes back and his wife, Anna, they're very old, was pregnant. So it's like, this is the Immaculate Conception. There's something, they don't go into details or whatever, but uh, can you imagine, uh, can you imagine uh, why the Roman Catholic Church would not jump on this? The Immaculate Conception is not particularly an Eastern Christian doctrine, not at all, but it is a Western Roman Catholic doctrine. And it's just unimaginable why they wouldn't promote this document which dates that doctrine of theirs to the second century AD, the middle of the second century, historically, with an actual artifact here. Lots of mysteries with this thing, and I just, I haven't figured them out yet. So Joachim, this is where you have some temple stuff going on, and I want my colleagues here who uh, know about that kind of thing uh, Joachim uh, wants to test it and make sure that the child was actually a sign of mercy from God. So he looks at the petalon of the priest, which is some kind of a garment that the priest, the high priest wears, um, and at the altar of the temple, and he comes away justified. He figures out by something he saw or, you know, or observed uh, with the, uh, this garment that the high priest had that uh, yes, in fact, this was uh, God's gift to him to uh, justify his, uh, his childlessness. So six months old after Mary's born, her mother puts her down on the ground for the first time and she takes seven steps and then her mother snatches her up and she never touches the ground again until uh, she's three years old, and they take her and put her on the steps of the temple when she runs up into the temple. Uh, talking about ultimate, ultra-holiness here, okay? Um, okay, this is what's really interesting here. Uh, and it gets more interesting the more I look into this. Joachim, her, her father, throws a party, a birthday party for Mary's first birthday, and invites the high priests, the priests, the scribes, the elders, and all the people of Israel to this birthday party. And everybody just loves Mary. You know, the high priests bless her. They pick her up. The priests bless her. Everything's fine. And, you know, this is a Christian document, a Christian document very, very early, possibly first century. And they like the temple and they like the high priests and they like the priests. 
And Mary's parents are very wealthy magnates in Jerusalem who donate all kinds of money to the temple. And so they're in the high society. This is high society of Jerusalem. Uh, in the first, late first century, early second century, and from everything I know about early Christianity, you know, those are the times when Judaism and Christianity part ways and really don't like each other very much, you know, uh, from that time on. And the second thing that jumps out at you here is there are no Pharisees at this birthday party. And I was just got verification from Danny and uh, Jim Charlesworth yesterday that, yeah, the Pharisees don't really become a factor, at least in the, uh, the Christian perception of things, until after the destruction of the temple, when, uh, you know, that's the Pharisees are pretty much all that's left. Uh, everybody else is wiped out. The priests are gone. Everybody's gone. So the Pharisees aren't that much of a presence early, early on. So that's another possible hint that this document is first century, maybe even earlier than uh, the first century destruction of the temple. Possibilities. Uh, we won't know for sure until uh, I can get all these documents together and have a look at how the, uh, the text of the document uh, developed. Uh, more on the Jerusalem temple. Three years old, uh, she's taken to the temple. Uh, the priest of the Lord receives her, kisses her, blesses her, places her on the third step of the altar place of sacrifice. Now, where that is, uh, we'll have to ask Gary and Danny. I'm not sure where the, which set of steps that is. Uh, and the Lord gives her grace. And she dances. She dances at the altar. And all the people of Israel loved her. Now, this is just outrageously unlike anything else you'll see in, in early Christian documents. Uh, okay, we're getting there. Uh, Mary lived in the temple of the Lord like a dove, was fed by an angel for nine years. At the age of 12, the priests basically had to get her out of there, according to this document. Here again, I'm looking, hoping you found, Danny said they found one bell of the priest's garment. I hope they, they come up with a, some kind of an item that had 12 bells on it that the high priest took in there. Now, I don't know if anybody's ever heard of anything like that. Uh, and he prays about her. Joseph, the widower, wins Mary by lot, takes her away from the temple. Uh, then they, uh, Mary and seven other undefiled virgins are weaving a new veil for the temple. Uh, Mary is weaving the red and the purple. And uh, then two angels come along announcing the birth of a son who will save his people from their sins. Uh, and Mary becomes pregnant. Uh, Joseph discovers her pregnancy. Everybody thinks she's uh, an adulteress. She is given this uh, water of examination by the priest and she is uh, exonerated. Uh, and uh, that's the updated version. Okay, that's the revised version. This is what happened in the Genesis, in the original document. There are no angels that come to announce the birth of Jesus. Uh, there is a voice in the temple. Mary is living in the temple, probably in the Holy of Holies or at least the Holies. Again, the, the archaeologists have to figure all that out. Uh, and she hears this voice, the bat kol, the voice of God, telling her she's blessed. And that's, you look at Ezekiel 43, and uh, that's exactly the kind of thing that happens, the voice of God out of the, out of the sanctuary. And then Mary after hearing this, sits on the throne. The, the document says she sits on the throne and is weaving the purple thread. Now, if, if Mary was at home when this was happening, you know, she has a throne at her house. I mean, you know, what? So uh, the implication here is that she sat on the throne of God once she had conceived her child 
and she's weaving purple thread, which is the royal purple, the royal thread. Uh, so this is the original story. Uh, very pa uh, paradoxic, very paradoxical uh, type of thing. And this is what I've been saying. The, uh, the Annunciation, according to the reviser, the editor of this, he takes Mary out of the temple and he brings angels and archangels to take her back and forth and she's weaving the thread at home. And the question is whether she had a thread at home. Uh, 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 whether she uh, was at home, I'm sorry, when she was doing that. Um, so uh, it's interesting, Jesus is never named in this document. Uh, in the original story, she gives birth to a child outside of Bethlehem. It's not in Bethlehem. Now, how strange is that? Uh, the later editor uh, fixed that by inserting a material from Matthew. And he also, uh, the editor also inserts this story where Jesus' sister Salome verifies Mary's postpartum virginity with a physical examination. And this is where the doctrine of the perpetual virginity of Mary came from. So, final conclusion, the Genesis of Mary has been orthodoxy cleaned. I coined that word, orthodoxy clean, uh, and transformed into the Protovangelium of James, which is the most important source of uh, early Christian Mariology. Not just early, but subsequent uh, Christian uh, Mariology. So that's my uh, dog and pony show. <laughs> How do you want to handle the questions? <laughs> Thank you.